As the spirit was moving over the waters, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the waters, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, spirit where you my heart down when you feel the
Well, hello to all of you joining in with us at GetHope.tv. This week, we are in week five, our final week of a series that we have been calling Asking for a Friend. But before we get into that, I want to give you an update on where we are with Hope Where You Are. Now, if you're just tuning in with us for the first time or if you have no idea what that is, Hope Where You Are is really a vision of where we believe God is calling us over the next 12 to 18 months and the ways that we believe God is calling us to impact the community and the world around us. But when we cast this vision five or six weeks ago, what we said was this is going to cost us about $1.8 million above and beyond our regular budget for the year. But here's what I want you to know. In the last five to six weeks, you as Hope Community Church have already generously contributed over $630,000. And so we're already a third of the way to our goal. And so we just want to say thank you for your generosity. You're going to be hearing some stories in the weeks ahead about how that's already impacting our local community and how we're already impacting Haiti as a result of that. Can't wait to share those with you. But for now, I just want to say, keep it up. Thank you for your generosity. Week five, asking for a friend. You are going to have the privilege this week of hearing from our very own Dwayne Calvin. If you don't know, Dwayne is actually our Raleigh campus pastor. And this is what I would want you to know about Dwayne. Dwayne is actually one of the greatest men. He's one of the finest men that I've ever met in my entire life. And you are in for a treat and the rest of our time together. Here's what we're going to be looking at this week in our final question. And I would say it's probably the most important question that we've looked at throughout this entire series. And I know we all would agree that it's what our world needs right now. And the question is this, how do we love someone that we disagree with? And we know with everything that's going on around the world right now, this is something that we could all use a little bit more of. And in fact, I want you to watch a video here that kind of highlights this story. But I do want you to know the nature of this video, it's covering what for some could be an incredibly sensitive topic. And so I just want you to know that if this does something inside of you, if we can do anything for you as a church, uh, we are here. But what you're going to see is two people coming together with an incredibly sensitive topic who are coming at it from different perspectives, but through being willing to listen to one another and love one another well through the process, they come to a place that neither one of them would have necessarily expected, but is exactly what God had intended. Let's watch the story together. I found out I was pregnant in February of 2018, and I immediately was scared, um, overwhelmed. My first reaction was, I'm not having this baby. And I made an appointment at the abortion clinic, and then I was going to a church in Fuquay at the time, they told me about Hand of Hope, and they said that they, you know, give free ultrasounds and, um, you know, all this other stuff. And so I remember when I walked in, you were there. When I first met you, um, I just loved you right away. And every time you showed up, I just loved you a little bit more. And I definitely thought that you had valid challenges you were facing as we kept meeting week after week, it always had to be your decision. It could never be my decision or anyone else's decision. My role kind of became your cheerleader in encouraging you to see how this baby and God's plan for this new direction for your life could still work with your plans, just maybe a little different. You saw something that I did not see it myself. But I do, I think it was just like, I, I know that when I saw her on the ultrasound, that was huge for me, huge for me. It took somebody walking with me through it, those moments for me to, for my head and my heart to match up, if that makes sense. What would you say to yourself four years ago on that pregnancy day, that pregnancy test day? What, what would you look back and say to that woman as she saw those two little pink lines on that pregnancy test? I would just say that this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. I'm sorry. (laughs) But that's what I would say. And I can't even imagine my life without her. 
in light of the topic of abortion, how would you suggest or what is your recommendations on how to love someone well that you strongly disagree with? If I approach them with love, like genuine love, even though I know that they do not agree with me, come at it from a place where I'm thinking, how would God want me to respond to this person? Really, what it boils down to is just to be a good ambassador for Jesus. Yeah, I totally agree. As Christians, we are called to a higher standard. Our standard that Jesus holds us to is higher than any legislation. It's higher than any law. It's the law of love, and that's what we're called to. And yeah, it can be tricky sometimes because you can really disagree really strongly with people, but, but at the end of the day, it really is loving others well.
Well, Father, we do thank you. We celebrate the freedom that we have in our lives as a result of the work of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the freedom that we find ourselves in. We thank you for the freedom that that calls us into. Lord, as we are now spending some time opening your word, uh, I pray that it would speak to us, that it would connect with us in our hearts, and it would call us and move us and cause us to be faithful to the ways that you have called us to live our lives. We're looking at a question that's so important. How do we love people who have a difference of opinion than we do? Father, we're in a place in our culture, in our society, where it just seems like our differences are being elevated every time we turn around. Help us to be the people that answer your prayer, Jesus, that your church would be unified. Help us to be the people that you have created us to be and that you call us to be, people that love others right where they are. Lord, we love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How you guys doing today? All right. Well, let me start by saying welcome to all of you guys. My name is Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Community Church, and it is my privilege to share this time with you today. Uh, listen, I want to welcome you all watching at one of our physical campuses and all of you two watching at GetHope.tv. We're so glad you guys could join us today. Now listen, over the past few weeks, the past four weeks to be exact, Chase Gardner, our teaching pastor, has been weekly sharing message with, messages with us in this series called Asking for a Friend. And he has done a phenomenal job of unpacking and answering questions that you guys submitted to us, questions that you hoped that we would share a bit of a biblical foundation with you for, and that you could take those things back to your community, your neighbors, and even your friends. And Chase has done a great job with it. So just for a minute, no matter where you are, can you just give Chase a little bit of love like our teaching pastor, Chase Gardner? Yeah. He has done a great job with this series, and we've had some difficult questions. And today is no different. This is going to be a tough one. I got to tell you, like, like of all the questions over the past four weeks and even this week that we have asked and answered, I believe that this one touches the lives of more people than all the other ones combined. Like this is something that every single one of us faces, and, and the truth is, is that if we don't do well with this, I think we run the risk of missing our mission as the church. So what's the question? I'm glad you asked. Here's the question. How do I love people that I disagree with? Better said, how do I respond to people with love that don't like me or who deeply conflict with my Christian values? 
And this is a challenging thing, I gotta tell you, because in today's world, it is easy to disagree with somebody. Like, there are so many issues that we find disagreement on. Even though we know we might have a solid foundation in which we stand, we have a lot of things that we kind of question and we struggle with. And I'll just give you a few that we tend to disagree with. Uh, Let me give you a couple. The first one, racial divisions, right? There's a lot of disagreement there. Here's another one, LGBTQ issues. There's a lot of disagreement in that one. Here's another one that we've recently found, pro-life, pro-choice issues, right? right, Let me add one more to the equation that all of us are probably struggling with even today, gun violence. And if we're honest, these are difficult issues. And all of us has an opinion and all of us has a stance, right? And it used to be like when I was growing up, when I was a young man, uh, the truth is, is that it was difficult to disagree with somebody because in order to have a disagreement, you had to know them. You had to be in relationship with them, right? Because we didn't have any of these. We didn't have phones. We didn't have access to three to five social media accounts apiece. So if you wanted to degree, disagree with somebody, you had to be in the room with them. But nowadays, every person has access to technology, to digital platforms, and everybody has three to five accounts. And so here's what happens. We disagree with people that we don't know. People who are across the country or even across the world, and it's easy to find ourselves in tough situations where we simply disagree. And I got to tell you, the way we handle those disagreements matters. And it doesn't just matter to us, it matters to God. Because I believe that God would have us to love people in the midst of those kinds of disagreements. And sometimes we handle it really, really well. And if we're honest, sometimes we don't. I am guilty of not always handling it so well. And I don't know about you, but there's been moments in my life that I wish I just had back because I had a disagreement with somebody and things didn't end well. One kind of rises to the top. One issue I had, um, listen, I don't know how much you know about my story, but prior to me serving as a pastor at Hope Community Church, I got the privilege and the honor of serving until I retired in 2014 as a United States Marine. It was the privilege of my life. It was an absolute honor. And so here's what that meant. That meant that every three years, my wife, my children, and I, we had to pack up everything our own, well, everything we owned, because our uncle, Uncle Sam, was sending us to a new place. And so we would go to this new place, right? We would show up, and some of those places were great, and there were new experiences and new opportunities for everybody in the family, but some of them were not so great, and here's why. Because every time you packed up and moved, you ran into a new boss. Now, uh, don't point to anybody, okay? But just by show of hands in the room where you are, how many of you have ever had a horrible boss? Don't point. I said don't point. People pointing all over the room. There's a, there's a kid at GetHope.tv that just pointed to his dad. That's not okay, young man. Don't point to your father. But I had an epic, horrible boss in one of these places. And we're going to call him David because his name is David, okay? <laughs> just call him David. That's his name. <laughs> Let me describe David a little bit. This guy was like five foot nothing, right? Like, that's a height. Let's move on. A hundred and nothing pounds, right? And he was angry. And I'm not talking about just any old kind of angry. I'm talking about special kind of angry. Like this guy walked in every room and the way he started conversations was by yelling. If he had a gift, a spiritual gift, it was the gift of yelling. He was a gifted yeller. Like this guy would yell up at me and I'd be like, I'm going to do it. Like, calm down. <laughs> like, so all he did was yell and get angry. And I couldn't figure it out why. And everybody in the office had our suspicions of why he was so angry. Um, I personally believe that it was probably because he was a vegan. Like, I just believed that that was why he was angry. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to say that. I mean, I would be angry too if I didn't have access to delicious meats like steak and bacon. Of course, I'd be mad too. So I just wrote it off as this guy's got to be a vegan. He wasn't a vegan, but that's funny. I don't care who you are. He wasn't a vegan. <laughs> But he was mad all the time, and I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what was wrong with him, so I developed a set of rules. I developed a strategy to deal with David. I called it the David discipline, right? Now, I had a 45-minute commute into work every day. So when I was driving in, I would listen to Christian radio in the morning. I would listen to my sermons, Tony Evans, whoever was on, and I'd get to work, and I'd be prepared to deal with David in the morning, right? And so I would deal with him for the morning time, and then lunch would come, and I would separate myself, and I would simply read my Bible, and that would help me to deal with David through the afternoon. I called it the David discipline. And it worked for a while. 
until David messed it up. This guy comes to me one day and I'm sitting there minding my business, reading my Bible by myself. And he holds my Bible up, he kind of picks it up off the table and looks at it just to make sure I'm actually reading the Bible. And he says, do you believe the stuff in that book? And to which I responded to David, and I had just got done reading the Bible cover to cover, so I was pretty confident. I said, yes, I believe the stuff in that book to be true. I believe the Bible to be true. And so he looks at me square in the face, and he says, then you, sir, are an idiot. Now listen, I don't know how much you guys know about me, but that would have been enough for me to click off safe, like right then, I was ready to go. David was about to have a bad day. Hulk was about to smash. And the worst part about the whole thing, right, the worst part about the whole conversation was that David had this look on his face like the Grinch that stole Christmas. Like he knew where this thing was going, right? Like he had a plan here. He was going to try to disrupt me. And I was still standing there trying to be patient. I was trying to be calm. My fists were balling up. I think like a tear might have dropped from my eye. But I kind of held on. I was like, I'm not going to be mad. I'm going to be okay. I said, okay, thank you, David. Have a good day. Well, he goes away and then he comes back for a second pass. And he stops again and he says, so wait, so do you like talk to God? To which I answer, yes, I talk to God. Christians, we call it prayer, right? Uh, we call it prayer. So yes, I talk to God. He goes, well, I need to get you a mental health examination because you're talking to people who aren't in the room. Can I just tell you, by that time I had had enough of David. I was getting ready to take David out, y'all. I thought to myself, Lord, how far can I throw this man in Christian love? <laughs> but I didn't. As a matter of fact, I was so upset. I was kind of shocked by his responses and his behavior. So I slammed on the desk with my hands because if I didn't slam on the desk, they, those hands probably would have gone on David. And so that poor desk, right? And I stormed out of my office. I jump in my car and I drive home. And the whole way going home, I am like frustrated. I'm angry. But my pastor at the time had shared some words with me that have stuck with me even to this day. Here's what he said. He said, Dwayne, it's easy to love people who are easy to love. But what about the people who are not so easy to love? And that, those words, I wish he hadn't told me because they just kind of stuck in my head and they haunted me the whole way home. And then I got home, I think I talked to my wife, we prayed, I told her what happened that day and she's like, you gotta go back and apologize. And I'm like, I gotta apologize? Okay, fine. So the next morning I go back into work and I start to apologize to David. And I don't know how you start your apologies, but here's how I started mine. David, yesterday, you acted like a jerk. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. <laughs> I said, but so did I. And man, I'm sorry for how I behaved and the way I walked out. And I don't know why you seem so upset at the office every single day, but here's what I do know, man. I know that if you ever want to talk about anything, I'm here, brother. And so I'm sorry for the way I behaved. I mean, I was ready to go. I was ready to get out of there. I was ready to go. I didn't want him to ask any questions. I didn't want to try to like explain my apology. And David did something strange in that moment. He stopped me and he said, brother, do you have a second? And I said, yes, I do. And we peeled away and we sat down and we began to talk. And I watched in front of me in that moment, a 40-year-old man melt right before my eyes. David started sharing with me some of his, the challenges that he had been facing. You see, he had grown up in an abusive household. And that abuse never stopped when he left home and joined the Marine Corps. As a matter of fact, it only continued into his marriage. And it was an abusive marriage where he was the one being physically abused by his wife. And so when he came to work angry, it was only a response to what he was dealing with. And he had just ended a divorce of a 14-year marriage. And I didn't know any of that. And then he went on to continue and share uh, that, that not only was he abused, but the reason why he was yelling was because when he joined the Marine Corps, no one would take him seriously because of his height. And so he thought the way that he would get things done is by yelling at everyone. This guy unpacked his whole life in front of me, y'all. And I almost missed it. I almost missed an opportunity to love someone who was hurting. And man, I just kicked myself, even to this day. Fortunately, David gave me another chance. 
And we ended up becoming friends and David actually ended up being a Christ follower when it was all said and done. But I almost missed that opportunity. You see, what I needed in that moment is the thing that I think we all need. I needed some, some help with like how I was gonna respond when somebody disagreed with my faith. Um, I needed some guiding principles to help me along the way. And I believe that there's guiding principles in everything. We start learning them from the time that we're even little kids. Like a guiding principle when you're a little kid that you learn is that when you cross the street, you do what? You look both ways before you cross the street. You might see a chicken out there, but look both ways, right? That's a guiding principle. If you go camping, a guiding principle is that the first day you go camping, you set your tent up. And when you set your tent up, it's because you don't want it to rain. And if it rains, you want to have shelter. So that's a guiding principle. Now, I'm from the Northeast, so we have snow. And a guiding principle in the Northeast is stay away from the yellow snow. It is not a free snow cone. Guiding principles. You're welcome. <laughs> Whatever snows in the triangle, you can use that. <laughs> but guiding principles are in everything. And the best of the guiding principles are found in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. Because those guiding principles were true yesterday and they are true today and they'll even be true tomorrow. You see, here's the thing. The Bible is full of guiding principles. And today, the guiding principles that we're gonna use to guide this conversation on how we respond to people who we disagree with in a way that is loving, the guiding principles come in the form of two power-packed words that I believe if we apply to how we live our lives will change our very lives. And they're the words grace and truth. And these are powerful words in and of themselves, but together they're even more powerful. So let's just take a second before we jump into the text to define these words. The word grace, here's what it means. It means God's undeserved favor. And I believe that God's grace has the power to save people's lives. And I only believe that because I see it captured in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter two, uh, that very thing is actually said there. It says that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that means that none of us, none of us can boast of our own efforts or our own works because we are saved by grace. You see, grace has the power to save. When Jesus presents us before God, he covers the sin that Jesus would see and that would separate us with one thing, grace. And he gives it freely and he gives it openly and he shares it with those of us who have found our way to the end of ourselves. And so God's grace saved. Well, that's a powerful word, but truth is also a very powerful word. And here's my definition of truth. I believe that truth is anything that is consistent with the mind, the will, the glory, the word of God. And truth can be defined as having complete reliability. The reliability that's linked to the dependable and unchanging character of Jesus. So grace saves, but truth has the power to actually set us free. The Bible says over in John, it says that you will know the truth and it'll be the truth that actually sets us free. So grace saves, truth sets us free. Individually, those are powerful words, but collectively, they actually describe the very character of Jesus Christ. And let me just submit today that I don't believe there ever was or ever will be anybody who is better at sharing grace and truth with this world, who is more full of grace and truth than Jesus Christ. He was the ultimate example of grace and truth. Let, let me tell you what I mean, right? So over in John's gospel, when John is describing Jesus, here's what John says about Jesus. He calls Jesus the word. He says, and the word became flesh and the word dwelt among us, right? And we have seen his glory, the glory as of one, only, the only son from the father, full of, there it is again, those two words, grace and truth, describing Jesus. And later in that same section of scripture, in verse 17, it says these words, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through who? Jesus Christ. There it is again, grace and truth. And all throughout the Bible, all throughout the New Testament of the Bible, in Jesus' ministry, we see examples and moments where Jesus encounters someone and he shares with them that same grace and truth. Because grace and truth is the very character of Jesus himself. 
So today, we're actually going to look at one of those stories. Now, if you have your Bible, here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and open it to John chapter 8, okay? And we are going to start at verse 1, and we're going to work our way through to verse 11. I'll give you some time to find it. And if you don't have your Bible with you, please know that at your physical campus, it'll be on the side screens. And if you're watching at GitHub.tv, it'll show up on your screen as well, and you can follow along, okay? Now, while you're trying to find it, I want to set the stage for you and tell you what the scene looks like before we jump into the text, right? Now, here's the scene. Jesus and the disciples have been hanging out, right? And they've been walking to different areas, right? And they find their way to this area in Jerusalem, right? Now, there is a festival that is going on in that area known as the Feast of the Tabernacle. I want you to think of this feast as a big outdoor block party. Now, if you're over 40, without all the drugs and the craziness, think of Woodstock. If you're under 40, without all the drugs and the craziness, think of Coachella. That's the kind of party this is, right? This is a seven-day outdoor party. There would have been food. There would have been drinks. I mean, it would have been a crazy scene, right? The kids would have been out there doing the TikTok dances. Will Smith's summertime would have been playing in the background. Summer, summer, summertime. Pre-slap Will Smith, not post-slap Will Smith. Y'all focus. But it would have been a good party, y'all. Seven days. Seven days of partying. Can I just say, ain't no party like a tabernacle party. Because a tabernacle party don't stop. Seven days. And Jesus is kind of watching all this play out, right? And every day, everybody would party, and Jesus would kind of break away to the Mount of Olives, right? Because he has work to do. And then that last day, as the party is winding down and people are going home, Jesus makes his way to the temple courts. And that next morning, early in the morning, he starts to teach. And that's where we find this scene at verse 1. It says this, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Let's just stop and rest right there for a second because I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many questions. Like when I read the Bible, I always ask myself, like, what questions uh, do I find in the text, right? And so as I'm reading the Bible and I read that passage, I'm like, I have so many questions. Here's the first question. You probably have the same questions. How did they catch her in the act of adultery, right? Like how does that even happen? How do you catch somebody in the act? And, and as I was racking my brain about this question, I only came up with two responses. The first one is, is either they were following her, like hoping that she made a mistake. And that could have been possible, right? They could have been following her. You ever have somebody like wait for you to mess up? Like wait for you to make a mistake? Like watch your life and watch like your, your social media posts, hoping that you fail or hoping you mess up. So that could have been possible, right? Uh, the only other thing that I can say, like how did she get caught in adultery is that maybe they set her up. But either way, it feels like something fishy is going on in this area. And here's the second, here's the second question that I have, the second big question. Well, I guess it's the third. Here's the third big question that I have. This is a pretty big one. Where's the man? Like, like this woman's caught in adultery. They bring her before Jesus. But, but here's a question like, why didn't they bring the man? And what we're going to find a little later in the chapter is that if someone is caught in adultery, that the penalty for that is death. But yet they bring her and they don't bring him. And they put her in front of Jesus. And they put her at the feet of Jesus and they're hoping that Jesus is going to bring condemnation. Let's look at verse 5. Here's what it says. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were talking to Jesus. They were using the question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus just bent down and he started to write on the ground with his finger. So here they go, they drop this woman off, and they're hoping to accuse her, right, and hoping that Jesus is going to condemn her. They're hoping that Jesus is going to, like, destroy her and allow them to stone her. But Jesus doesn't do that at all. He doesn't condemn her at all. They put her at the feet of Jesus. And how many of you know that at the feet of Jesus is not a bad place to be? You see, it's at the feet of Jesus that every single person finds themselves 
when they come to the end of themselves. And I believe that it's at the, feet, the very feet of Jesus that lives are changed, that no matter how far your trajectory has gone off course, at the feet of Jesus is where Jesus directs our path. And this woman finds herself in that moment at the very feet of Jesus. And these men are hoping for condemnation, but Jesus doesn't give her any of that. He just gets on the ground and he starts to write. And we don't know exactly what he wrote, some commentators think that he may have wrote the dates of these men's sins. Some think he may have listed their sins in a row, but we don't know exactly what was written there. But here's what we know. Whatever it was, it was enough to get their attention. Because when we move over to verse 7, Jesus couples it with these words. Here's what he says. It says that when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he starts writing in the dirt. And these men have no idea what to do with that. <laughs> They're standing there hoping for condemnation. And Jesus shows this woman in that moment incredible grace. Incredible grace. Incredible grace. I mean, it's an amazing scene. He goes on. He says, it says this. It says that, it says that he wrote on the ground, and then it says, woman, where are they? Has anyone condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. And Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. So he shares incredible grace with this woman. And then right after that, he shares incredible truth. See, he says, listen, I, I know that these men came to condemn you, but there's nobody left. Like they all dropped their stones. Every single one of these men had dropped their stones and walked away from the oldest to the youngest. They had walked away and Jesus showed her incredible grace. But in that moment, he tells her, go and sin no more. You see, he didn't breeze over the sinful behavior that he had been caught, she had been caught in. Instead, he shared truth with her. I want you to go, and I want your life to change. And this is an incredible scene. It's amazing. But it's just one example of grace and truth and how Jesus shares those things with people. And the Bible is full of those kinds of conversations. It's full of those kinds of moments. And so the, the quick answer to the question of how do we love people we disagree with is grace and truth. And this is where we're going to hang out for the rest of our time. And what I want to do for the next few moments is I want to share with you just a few things for your toolbox that you can use to live out this grace and truth. And I believe that if we'll apply these things to how we live our lives, then we will be well on our way as a church of living out grace and truth. So, so here's the first tool I want to share with you. The first tool I want to share with you is, is that, listen, I need you to recognize that Jesus has enough grace and truth for everyone, even for them. Let me say it one more time. I need you to recognize that, that Jesus has enough grace and truth for everyone, even them. Uh, in the beginning, in John's description of Jesus, he says that Jesus was full of both grace and truth. This means that Jesus wasn't 50% grace or 50% truth. He was 100% grace and 100% truth. And the word that's used to describe Jesus' fullness there is a Greek word, pleris. And that word means filled to the brim, to the point where if you touch it, it will overflow. That's the kind of grace and truth that Jesus has. And if he has that kind of grace and truth, he has it for me, and he has it for you, and he even has it for them. And if we're honest, every single one of us has a them. There's somebody who may be in our life or maybe at a distance from our life who we look at and we say, I don't think that Jesus could save that person. 
And it might be a division that you have over their beliefs. It might be something that you shared with them and experienced. But whatever it is, we all have that person that's a them. And for that person, here's what I'm going to say. I would love for you to ask yourself this question. Who is the person that I disagree with so much that I want to see them miss out on the grace and truth of Jesus? And I'm hoping that your answer will be no one. (laughs) Because Jesus has enough. And he gives out grace and truth freely, even for them. You see, at some point, every single one of us was a them. And God saw fit to grant us grace and truth, and he can do the same for every single person. So the first thing we need to do is we need to recognize that Jesus has enough grace and truth for us and for them. Here's the second thing that we need to do. The second thing that we need to do if we're going to live out grace and truth is that we need to lean into what we lack. And here's what I mean by that. Now, listen, there are different kinds of people in the world, right? And all of us have grown up with some kind of a background and some kind of a structure and some kind of a way of living. And so I believe that all of us have a tendency to either lean heavily into grace, right, or heavily into truth. And it's okay, I like guess it's just the reality, like some of us lean heavily into truth. I am more of a truth-based person. And if you are a truth-based person, right, your tendency is going to be that you really, really like rules. You really value things like justice. Uh, you really value things like fairness, right? And that's because you are a truth-based person. And the challenge with being a truth-based person, if you never add grace to your truth, you will lean so heavily into truth that at times you'll lose people. And you'll lose them because maybe you come off as a little too rigid or without empathy. Or maybe they'll feel like you don't have love. So we have to be careful, right? And we have to lean into what we lack. So if we have a little bit too much truth, then we lean a little bit into grace. And maybe you are a grace-based person, right? And so grace-based people really value friendships. They value forgiveness. They value the ability uh, to have friends. And sometimes, sometimes if they're not careful, they will allow friends to abuse situations over and over and over again because their grace is so heavy that they don't want to be seen as rigid or too structured or not empathetic. And if you're a grace-based person, you got to lean in a little bit of truth because grace without truth leads us down the road of chaos. And truth without grace leads us down the road of unforgiveness. No matter what you are, if you are a grace-based person, I affectionately call the grace-based person the you-do-you boo-boo Christian. Because that's what they say. You do you, boo-boo, it's fine. It's cool. I I affectionately call the truth-based person the telling it like it is Christian. I'm just telling it like it is, even if nobody asked them. (laughs) Whatever your bend is, you got to lean into what you lack. If we're going to do this well, we need to lean into what we like. Now, here's the last one, and I believe this is really impactful. This is the last one. I believe that if we are to do this well, and I believe that we need to learn how to live into the tension, right? Live into the tension of both grace and truth. Because I believe that in the tension is where the love of Christ is shared. We need to learn how to live into the tension of grace and truth because I believe that the, in the tension, the love of Jesus is shared. Now, here's what I mean by the tension. If we're going to live this way, the truth is, is that we're not going to always have the right answer. And at times, we are going to offend people just because of our beliefs or because of our stances. And so we're going to offend people from time to time. And that's just a difficult reality of this kind of thinking, Bulgarian and truth, right? And so here's the thing. When we offend people because of our stances, maybe, maybe it could be because we're not leaning into both grace and truth. And this is not a problem that we're going to quickly solve. It's a tension that we need to learn to manage, right? And here's what I mean by learning to manage the tension. On one side, you might have, like, grace, right? And on the other side here, you have truth. Well, if if we are all truth and no grace, there's no tension. And if we're all grace and no truth, there's no tension. And in the middle of that tension is where I believe the love lies. 
And so we have to live in the tension of grace and truth. You know, I love that video earlier of Katie and Kelly's story because that was a perfect example of living in the tension between grace and truth. And that was a really difficult issue, pro-life versus pro-choice issues. And if we're honest, this has been a source of confusion and frustration for a lot of people over the last few months, right? And so I'm sure they had some tense conversations. I'm sure they had some moments that were difficult, but somehow they learned how to live in the tension. They learned how to live in the tension. And they did it very well. That video was amazing. That beautiful little girl at the end of all of that. I mean, it was wonderful to just see all of that. And they did that individually, right? But we also have to learn how to do that as the church. We need to learn how to live in the tension. And so if we're going to get this right, we got to do this well as a church as a whole. Now, when I was reading and preparing for this message, I read a book. uh, And the book is called The Grace and Truth Paradox. And it's written by a pastor. And it's just a great read in general. But man, it was a great book. And the pastor shares in the book how as a pastor for 25 years, his church was never picketed. And then one week, his church got picketed. And then he got picketed again the week right after that. So two weeks in a row, he was picketed. And let me tell you what it was about. It was about pro-life versus pro-choice issues. And so their church had taken a pro-life stance And they found out that there were three groups that were rallying together to picket at their church. So he did what any good pastor would do. He went out and bought donuts and coffee and brought them to the church. And he set them up outside under a tent because he figured, hey, at least we're going to be able to have an honest conversation about this issue. And I'm going to show them the love of Christ. And so all these people came and they came ready to picket, right? They show up and they do exactly that. And he's sitting there with donuts and coffee. And he meets them right where they are. So they sit down, they start to talk, and would you know it, a pro-choice group, I'm sorry, a pro-life group shows up. And this argument starts. And before long, there's a fight in the parking lot. And he says, so I knew to do the only thing that I did, and so I sent the pro-life group home because we were having honest dialogue and I thought we were gonna get somewhere, so I sent them home. So they go home, right? The very next week, the pro-life group comes back and they pick it at his church. Remember what I said, that if we're trying to live in the tension between grace and truth, that sometimes people will get offended. And here's the thing, if we are leaning so much into truth that we forget about grace, we're leaning so much into truth that no one is ever offended, or sorry, if, if, if we're leaning so much into truth that everyone is offended from our responses, then maybe we're leaning a little bit too much into truth. And if we offend everyone, if we offend everyone, again, we're leaning too much into truth, but at the expense, I'm sorry, if we lean too much into grace, then we run the risk of ever, never offending anyone. And so we have to live in the balance between grace and truth because sometimes people will just be offended. And this is hard stuff, y'all, but I believe that we can get it right. I believe that we can live in that balance. And so the answer to the question of how do we love people who disagree with us? Well, we recognize that Jesus has enough grace and truth for everyone. We lean into what we lack and we live in the balance between grace and truth. Now, you know what would help us out a lot if we could get right? What would help us out a lot is if we could manage our phones just a little bit better. You know, in that story where those men were standing with rocks ready to throw at that woman, they were standing there holding those stones, right? And Jesus frees her from that situation. And listen, today we don't have any stones to throw at anybody, but you know what we do have? These are phones. And when Jesus says those words to those men, they drop their stones. And I think maybe, maybe today, if we're honest, we don't have stones, but we have phones. And we're ready with all of our social media accounts to pounce on any issue of disagreement. So in the same way that those men drop their stones, I think we may need to drop our phones. You know what works really well? (laughs) 
For people who disagree with this, instead of going to our phones, prayer. You see, prayer is at our disposal at all times. And I believe that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And so sometimes maybe instead of going to our phone to either insult or frustrate people or disagree vehemently with folks, maybe instead of going to the phone, we need to go to the throne in prayer. Because it works. I'm a living example of it in action. You see, I have a mother-in-law who's a praying woman, and my mother is also a praying woman, and both of them go to church every single weekend. And for years, I would watch those two ladies as I visited their churches. They would go down to the front because it was one of those old-school churches that had altar prayer at the end of the service. And those ladies would go down front. I would watch them do that, and I would think to myself the same thing that every young man thinks. Can't those women get right with Jesus for one week? It took me years to figure out who they were praying for. It was me. And instead of them discouraging me in areas that we disagree with, instead of them fighting with me and being frustrated with me, instead of them throwing their stones or their phones at me, they prayed for me. And I believe that it changed my whole life. And the truth is, is that like we all have things that we disagree with, but if we are going to get this right, and I believe we need to get this right, and maybe we need to drop those phones and go to the throne on people's behalf. And each one of us needs to rely on Jesus to build us up in this way, to build us up in grace and in truth. Because I believe that if we like trust God to build us up, then we will get this right. And this is right in line with our mission statement as a church, Hope Community Church. Our mission statement is to love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ, grace and truth. So if we are going to accomplish our mission as a church, if we're going to be all that God would have Hope Community Church to be, we need to allow him to build us up in grace and truth. And I pray that we would be that kind of church that would respond to people, even when they disagree with our faith, with those two words. So let's take a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the truth that you so freely give to us. Father, I just pray that we would be the kind of church that would live grace and truth. And the way that we respond to people, even when they disagree with us. And there's so many hard issues, Father God. There's so many things that we could find disagreement in. But I know that in order for us to love people where they are, we have to live grace and truth. So help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So some incredible words there from Dwayne. And really something that seems really simple, two words, grace and truth, not always the most easy thing to live out in our life. But I'm telling you, if we can get this right as a church, the power and the love that we all would find in the world around us would be incredible. Listen, we are wrapping up this series, Asking for a Friend. We hope it's been beneficial for you. We hope it's been powerful for you as an individual. But maybe you found some resources that you can share with some friends, some neighbors, some coworkers when they come to you with some of these questions. That's what it's here for. It's going to live online. Please take advantage of it. Next week, we are kicking off a brand new series that we are calling Worship, which is all about, guess what? Worship. But it's not just about music. It's ultimately how God created us and calls us into living lives of worship and what that could look like for us. So we want you to tune in next Thursday night, June 9th. We're actually going to be having a Thursday night live plus. So we hope you can join us in person there. But if not, we'll see you at another campus on Sunday or tune in right back in here with us at gethope.tv. 
Lastly, this week we are celebrating communion as a church. And you don't have to be in person at a gathering in a big building to do that. You can be at home. It doesn't even have to be in a church service. And so we have a resource for you at our website, gethope.net slash communion at home. And so I just want to encourage you, go there to that website with your family, with whoever you're watching this service with, and let's remember and celebrate who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then let's go out in the world and be the church that God has called us to be, living out grace and truth. Love you guys. See you next time.